Good evening. My name is John. I was one of Jesus' closest disciples. And you may have heard of me when I was a much, much younger man. But as I reflect on what I would write about my time with Jesus, I cannot help but remember what was going on the day before Christ rose from the dead. And I've decided to call that, and it would be in your language, I would decide to call that Saturday thinking. Because what were we doing the day before Jesus rose from the dead? Well, I was in hiding in a house with Mary, Jesus' mother, who had been entrusted to me at Jesus' crucifixion. And Peter was also there. And you might say we were waiting for a knock on the door. But the knock on the door that we were waiting for was not an announcement that Jesus had risen from the dead. No, the knock on the door was not even that, that maybe somebody had stolen Jesus' body. No, the knock on the door that we were most anticipating was going to be the one from temple guards or Roman soldiers coming to arrest us and maybe punish us as they had Jesus. And so I call this Saturday thinking in your language because it should have been a time of different thinking. And instead, it was a time of forgetfulness a time of almost hopelessness. And it isn't because that Jesus had not told us that he was going to rise from the dead. He told us that several times. One of the times that I remember most vividly is when uh, my brother James and I and the disciple Peter we went with Jesus up to the, uh, what's now called the Mount of Transfiguration. And up high on this mountain, there appeared with Jesus, can you believe this, Moses and Elijah? Well, Jesus, and I can't even describe it, Jesus' garment shone brightest that anyone could ever imagine. And if that wasn't enough, there was a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Well, you would have thought after such a magnificent display that I would have paid close attention, remembered everything that he said, remembered everything that I had seen with Jesus. And... Not too long after that, as we were walking along, he did tell us once again, speaking of himself, that the Son of Man would be arrested and that he would be killed and that on the third day he would rise from the dead. But here we were, that Saturday, the day before Jesus rose from the dead. And I was forgetful. It did not occur to me that this was the call, the message that I should be anticipating. Well, as I seek to write those things that I have heard and seen and listened to and, and even touched concerning my time with Jesus, again, I cannot help but going over what caused that to happen. What caused that forgetfulness, that hopelessness? Why were we sitting there acting like Jesus had never told us that he would rise from the dead? 
Well, one conclusion I came to was part of my Saturday thinking was my attitude toward other people. Now, if you were to read some of my later writings, I write a lot about love and love one another because that was Jesus' message to us. But I had to learn that from him. That wasn't the way I started out. In fact, in fact, Jesus, Jesus had a nickname for me and my brother James. You know what it was? He called us Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder. And there was one time that we almost literally lived up to our, our name. We were going through uh, Samaria on the way to Jerusalem. And there was a particular town in Samaria that would not make preparations for Jesus coming. And so James and I, we said, teacher, uh, would you bid us call fire down from heaven on this village? And of course, he didn't have us do that. And lest you think that this was just something that my older brother put me up to, to participate with him, there was a time on my own, my own initiative, where I saw a man who was, who was uh, uh, casting out demons in Jesus' name. Maybe I was a little bit jealous, but I rebuked him. And, but Jesus said, no, he who is not against us is, is for us. And so I saw the attitude that I had. On the one instance, it was some, some people who were not believers. The other instance was somebody who maybe was a believer that Regardless, my attitude, my words were not something that could have communicated to them the good news of a Jesus who had risen from the dead. And I don't know, is this just something to me or, or is that true for some of the rest of you that maybe your words, maybe your actions, attitudes towards believers or non-believers make it awful hard to go back and tell them, hey, there is a Jesus who was risen from the dead. Well, another element of this Saturday thinking was my, uh, what I would call my me first, have it my own way attitude. I'm Kind of ashamed to uh, share this, but again, on our way to Jerusalem, and this was actually the last time Jesus was going to go into Jerusalem. And this time, again, my brother James and I, and we got our mother involved in this one too, we kind of elbowed our way up to the the head of the uh, procession and then we said to Jesus master regarding uh, the positions of me and James master when you get into your kingdom would you bid it that that one of us sit on your right hand and one of us sit on your left well Jesus asked us a couple questions that were really deep. He asked us if uh, we could drink the cup that he drank. Could we be baptized with the baptism with which he was baptized? All referring to the kinds of, of sufferings uh, that he was going to be going through. And without hardly ever thinking, and later on, we knew it was certainly an idle, an idle reply. We said, we're able. But then he said, that may be so, but to sit on my right hand and, or on my left is not granted to me, but it is granted for the Father to decide. And then, perhaps even more embarrassingly, 
because in this instance, recorded for all of history to see, there are the words, at Jesus' last supper, at his last time gathered with us for a meal, it's recorded for everyone down through the ages to read. A dispute also arose among the disciples as to who was the greatest. The Last Supper of Jesus, and we're arguing about ourselves of who is the greatest. Jesus had told us before that who, he who would be great among us must be servant of all. Or he said about himself that I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And here we are, arguing about who's greatest. It's at that point, at the Last Supper, Jesus gave us a, a vivid object lesson of what he was talking about. Because he took off his outer garment and girded himself with a towel, and then he walked around and washed each of our feet. Had we not learned anything in three years of being with Jesus? <sighs> to be arguing at that night about who of us was greatest? And so I call that Saturday thinking because there we were three days after Jesus' profound object lesson and we're sitting behind closed doors and we're not thinking about serving others. We're not thinking about how to minister to others, to show Jesus' love to others. No, I was pretty much thinking about myself and what's going to happen to me. And so that, I would say, is another element that goes into what I would call my Saturday thinking. Now, a third element became most vivid after Jesus appeared to us. And let me explain how that came about. As I told you, when uh, on the, the day before the, the resurrection, and we were behind closed doors waiting for the knock on the door, waiting to possibly be arrested, well, there was that knock on the door, and we were startled. But it was Mary Magdalene, another one of Jesus' followers. And she said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where, he have, where they have laid him. Well, I looked right over at, at Peter, and I think he was thinking kind of like the same thing I was. Had the women gone to the wrong tomb? If somebody stole the body, where was it? Who took it? And a third th thought, could it be that which he had told us again and again that he would rise from the dead, that that could actually be true? Well, Peter and I bolted for the door, started running to the tomb. And since I was several years younger than Peter, I got there first. But I don't, didn't go into the tomb. The, the uh, large stone was, in fact, rolled away. But I just peered into the tomb. And, and Peter came up behind me kind of huffing and, and puffing. And he went right into the tomb. And I followed him. And you know, the tomb was not empty. Listen to me. 
listen to me carefully, the tomb was not empty. It was not as if somebody had gone in there and, or somebody's that it would have had to be, uh, picked up the wrapped body of, of Jesus and carried him out. No. It was not as if somebody had come in and unwrapped Jesus from all the burial wrappings and then taken his body because, because the burial wrappings were all wrapped as they would have been when Jesus' body was prepared for burial, except something was different. It was not as if somebody had hurriedly unwrapped him and all these wrappings are strewn across the tomb. No, they were still together. But they were collapsed. There was no body in there. The only conclusion we could make was that in fact Jesus had risen from the dead. Well you wouldn't think that I would necessarily need any reaffirmation after that but that very evening Peter and I were with uh, most of the other disciples and we're trying to tell them things that we that we saw, and uh, about that time, here again, we're behind closed doors, and Jesus appeared to us, and he showed us the nail prints in his hands, and the wound in his side, giving us indisputable evidence of the truth of what he had told us many, many times before. This was not a case of mistaken identity. This was not a case of wishful thinking. Jesus had, in fact, risen from the dead. Well, as if that wasn't enough, eight days later, we're meeting again and Again, I'm almost ashamed to say it. We're, we've got the doors closed, still a little bit skittish. And uh, Thomas is with us, and he wasn't there with us in the previous time when, when, uh, when Jesus appeared. And old Thomas, he, he was always hard to convince. He, he wouldn't listen to us. He said, unless I take my hand and touch the nail prints in his hand, and unless I reach out and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. Well, we were fumbling around. Somehow, uh, won't you take our word for it? Just didn't seem to work. Well, about the time we were fumbling around uh, of an, for an answer uh, with Thomas, again, Jesus appeared, and he said to Thomas, Thomas, stretch out your hand and place your finger in the wounds in my hands. Stretch out your hand and place it in my side. Do not be faithless, but believing. Well, Thomas's response, none of us, could improve on it because Thomas immediate response was to sink to his knees proclaiming my Lord and my God Amen. well again you would think that would be enough to send us on our way, to get us out in our mission, and yet we were still fumbling around as what to do next, what steps to take. And here's where we get into what you might say delayed Saturday thinking. Because after a while, seven of us decided to go back to Galilee. You know, Galilee, we were, we were fishermen when we started out. We were fishermen when Jesus called us. And 
This is what we grew up knowing, what we were familiar with. The same area. And after a time, Peter says, I'm going fishing. Again, it's almost as if had those three years with Jesus meant nothing? Are we going back to what was familiar? What is easiest? What's most comfortable? What we maybe know the best? Well, we really couldn't fault Peter because we all said the same. We will go with you. Well, I'm not going to go into the details, but Jesus appeared to us uh, again. And I'll write down the details uh, of that later. But here again, it was a kind of thinking that prevented us from getting behind the truth of what Jesus had taught us, the truths behind what we had heard and seen, and the all too easy step back into the usual, what's most comfortable. Well, it's been many years now since I walked with Jesus, many years since I saw him heal and heard him teach and saw him risen from the dead. I've become certainly not a doubting follower of him. I am confirmed in my following of him now. I have led several congregations. I have discipled people both young and, and old. I have even written some letters that uh, are being distributed over vast regions. But again, as I write down certain things, I have to go back to think of how easy it is to get into Saturday thinking. How about yourselves? The, the matter of calling fire down from heaven on someone. Your attitude toward other people that maybe if you could, you would have. <laughs> uh, maybe it's a non-believer and they criticize your faith. Maybe they even mock your faith and you'd like to call down fire from heaven on them if you could. Or other believers that maybe they don't worship the same way you do or this thing or that thing. Could it be the Saturday thinking that each of us has makes it a little hard to go back and share with them the good news of Jesus Christ risen from the dead, forgiveness of sins, new life in him, if we have those kinds of attitudes? Or what about, do we ever have me first attitudes? Do you ever get upset at someone who takes credit for something you did, some nice thing you did, or uh, maybe even takes credit for s some ministry that maybe even you started, uh, and they take credit for it? Or do you ever find it hard to get dirty serving others <laughs> for Jesus? Or... You ever critical about a, a pastor or a teacher who, though they've prayed over what they're going to share, you know, you think you know better. <laughs> could it be for any of us that Jesus, if he could, would come up to us and say, did you come to be served or to serve? Or the third element of, of Saturday thinking, going back to the familiar. 
Tomorrow we celebrate Christ risen from the dead. Does the risen Lord make any difference? Has he made any difference previously this week? Will he make a difference in the days ahead? Is there any way people in any way, shape, or form know, going to know that you are a follower of the risen Savior who you, in fact, believe is going to actually come again? Is he somehow, are we too much in the familiar, the usual, so that the risen Savior is one compartment and the way we go about doing things and dealing with people is another compartment. In other words, is the risen Savior seen in the relationships you have with your spouses, with your family, with the people you work with, people you have leisure time with, or another when you go through difficult time, those times when you maybe have even expressed, God, have, have you forgotten about me? Do we forget the ever-present risen Savior who said, in this world, you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. Or the risen Savior who said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Saturday thinking makes us forget those things. Why did Jesus come to Bethlehem? Why did he die on a cross to forgive our sins, rise from the dead, demonstrating victory over sin and death. Well, it wasn't just for our benefit. It was, the second part was to send us on a mission, the mission to let others know about this risen Savior. So uh, as John, the apostle, I want to be a proclaimer of Jesus. If there are things that I have said tonight that uh, you have some questions about, I would be glad to, while I'm here, to see if I can answer any of those questions. But I, as John, the apostle, would proclaim the risen Savior. I would proclaim that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Um, let's have a prayer. He's, I think, got one more song, and Marjorie has a, a, an announcement. <clears throat> Lord, thank you for gathering us here tonight. And most of the times we don't think of this Saturday, the day before Resurrection Sunday, we, we often don't know what to do with it. And Lord, we, th we, we, we thank you tonight for maybe the ways that you have called us to make not only to make preparations uh, in our minds in our speech in our attitudes uh, in our worship for tomorrow but ways lord that indeed uh, as when we receive christ as our savior he lives uh, in us that we take him wherever we are this coming week and that he is evident in how we handle all kinds of, of situations. Lord, I thank you for gathering us here tonight. I thank you for the work that you would do in each of us as individuals to uh, grow closer in our walk with you. 
And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.